before we move on to the panel, I would just like to um, extend my thanks to Peter for an excellent and thought-provoking speech. I particularly like your references to the grey zone. And also I'd like to extend my thanks to, um, to ANU, particularly the Department of International Relations and Matt Davies for facilitating for me to come out to be a part of this very important workshop. Um, I'd like to call our first speaker, is Rayhan, who is um, a research fellow here at ANU. And um, would you like to um, come up and uh, present your first paper? for this introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Department of International Relations for having me on board, to Matt Davies, um, and Haroro for asking me to speak and be on this panel. I think it's a great privilege for me to be here. And again, thank you so much, Peter, for your inspiring speech. I'm half Egyptian, so for me, it's very exciting to hear from you. Um, my talk today, you know, obviously we'll be looking at sectarian rhetoric in ISIS propaganda. And as we all know, ISIS has made it very clear that it champions the Sunni cause in the Muslim world. ISIS magazines are filled with sectarian rhetoric focusing on both theological and political issues. The anti-Shia rhetoric is prominent in ISIS publications and social media outlets. It forms a significant element uh, element of ISIS propaganda. So the group works on constructing legitimacy in the eyes of its supporters and sympathizers. So it is understandable for it to exploit Sunni grievances in the region for legitimization purposes. So I'll be looking at sectarianism in ISIS propaganda. I will examine two areas, theology and politics, where ISIS tries to develop its reputation as the only formidable force against Shia actors in the region. So ISIS is a self-proclaimed Salafi movement, which means that the group aspires to emulate the pious ancestors, the first three generations of Muslims. So there are various trends within the Salafi thought throughout history. However, ISIS claims to follow the first Saudi state, which was established by Ibn Saud. A little bit of background here. Ibn Saud was endorsed by the founder of the Wahhabi school of thought. I'm sure we're all familiar with the idea of Wahhabism. Um, the, Wahhabi, the, the founder is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He founded the school um, you know, in the 16th century. Um, however, they established the first Saudi state in 1744. So Wahhabi is a derogatory identification of the followers of Imam Ibn Abdul Wahhab. His followers don't call themselves as Wahhabis. So they call themselves as Ahl al-Tawheed, which means people of monotheism. And later in the, uh, in the 70s, they adopted the term Salafis. And today, if you talk to uh, the followers of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, they identify themselves as Salafis and not Wahhabis. So the first Saudi state was militant in containing the Shia, a lot of similarities with ISIS. They engage in violence against the Shia. So in 1801, for example, the Wahhabi forces marched to Karbala in Iraq and sacked the city. They were responsible for killing 2,000 Shia believers. Some estimate the figure to be higher. So ISIS theological justifications for opposing the Shia is well articulated in their media war against the Shia. So ISIS utilizes three elaborate methods to formulate its theological attacks. So first, it relies on existing treatises by prominent theoreticians for legitimacy. So ISIS propaganda material incorporates Ibn Abdul Wahhab's thoughts when referring to the Shia especially his treatise, Arrad al rafida So al rafida means the rejectionist. It is a derogatory, a derogatory identification of 12 Shiism, which is the majority of Shia today, including in Iran, in Lebanon, um, in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia, and even in Bahrain. 
So the promotion of absolute monotheism in Salafi theology means that Shia practices are viewed as removed from Islam. So these include shrine visitations, and that's why you see them bombing shrines, um, intercession, and the beliefs in Shia imams. So the group dedicated an issue of its Dabiq magazine to discussing Shia theological corruption. So I've showed that earlier, the Rafida from Ibn Sabah to Dajjal. So in this issue, um, they argue that the Shia sect was invented by a Jewish man who aspired to destroy Islam from within. So this man converted to Islam, he deified Ali, who was the fourth caliph. Um, and to them, this violates the concept of monotheism reserved for Allah. ISIS also relies on the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, the 12th century jurist, who was prolific in, his, uh, in condemning various Shia sects. So Ibn Taymiyyah was highly critical of all Shia sects, declaring the um, adherence of these sects as completely removed from Islam and basically declaring the infidelity. As for contemporary figures, ISIS propaganda consistently refers to Mus'ab al-Zarqawi. As we all know, al-Zarqawi deviated from al-Qaeda central command by launching attacks against the Shia. This contributed to the sectarian civil war in Iraq. And despite the fact that al-Zarqawi was not a credible theologian, far from it, ISIS magazines and social media propagandists invoke his anti-Shia tirade. This is because unlike Sunni polemicists, who mainly declare the infidelity and treachery of Shia, including other jihadi theoreticians, al-Zarqawi was the first to make massacring Shia an agenda for al-Qaeda in Iraq and an agenda continued by ISIS. Similarly, Shia practices highlighted as deviant by the three figures mentioned earlier are also featured prominently in ISIS social media war against the Shia. So they, they include the marriage of Mut'a, a Shia practice allowing temporary marriage where a man and a woman enter a marriage contract for a specified uh, time period, three hours, three months, um, of course, Shia scholars have differing views on the subject. They have differing views. But Sunni polemicists, including ISIS, ignore the complexity of the matter, and that's always the case. Second, it analyzes historical events by presenting Sunni historiography. That's another method to formulate its theological attacks in its presentation of Sunni historiography. ISIS propaganda refers to historical events within the framework of sectarianism. For example, the Safavid dynasty is featured in Dabiq, where Shia ascendancy in 1501 was highlighted. So that's part of it. Who were the Safawiyah? With a picture of Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. So the publication speaks of Shia practices formalized during this period, including the mandatory cursing of the Prophet's companions, which is a major sin in Sunni Islam. Why refer to the Safavid dynasty? This is because the Iranian theocracy today, as argued by ISIS, is a continuation of the Safavid dynasty. And this is despite the fact that many of the practices of the Safavids are no longer practiced in Iran today. However, ISIS draws similarities between the Iranian government and the Safavid dynasty. It is a powerful tool to delegitimize the Iranian government, as the Safavid dynasty was viewed as oppressive of Sunnis. It was seen as responsible for converting Iranians by force to Shia Islam. I mean, this is quite dominant in Sunni polemicists, uh, in, in um, historical accounts. ISIS is aware that Muslims, which is quite interesting, are susceptible to look at historical events for reference. So in Muslim societies, history confirms faith. Um, that's not my saying, by the way. It's a uh, saying of a great professor based at the center, Professor James Piscatore. Uh, but you look at history, in many ways, history confirms faith. And third, It relies on Shia believers as far from mainstream Shiism as possible to solidify its claims of Shia deviance. 
So ISIS simplicity appeals to supporters. Its sectarian propaganda offers just that. Complexity is destabilizing and therefore is to be avoided. So it uses examples of Shia theologians on the fringes of Shia communities to delegitimize them. That's how it formulates its theological attacks as well. In its magazines and social media accounts run by sympathizers, ISIS uses Yasser al-Habib as the epitome of Shia deviance. So Yasser al-Habib is a Kuwaiti preacher who is known for insulting the prophet's wife, Aisha. Aisha is not very popular among Shia believers because she did not support Ali's claim to the caliphate. However, Yasser al-Habib's denunciation of her is often crude and cruel, which angers Sunnis. He is not considered as part of mainstream Shiism as he has been denounced by Shia clerics for inciting hatred. However, he is prominently featured in ISIS propaganda magazines and also social media outlets. So the second aspect of the ISIS media war against Shia believers is highlighting Shia political activities. And these activities are presented in a way to demonstrate the dangers of Shia actors in the region. And it's not very hard to do so for three reasons. Um, discussion of Shia treachery was common even before the emergence of ISIS. So they're just exploiting um, what's already there. The intensity and frequency of anti-Shia rhetoric is influenced by political circumstances of the region. So the first wave of anti-Shia rhetoric emerged after the 1979 Iranian Revolution. The Saudis um, have been particularly active, endorsed by the Saudi state in denouncing the Iranian Revolution. The anti-Shia narratives re-emerged following the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and was especially intense following the 2005 elections in Iraq. The 2005 elections witnessed a Shia government coming to power for the first time in Iraq. So if anti-Shia rhetoric was contained in certain countries, because not all Sunni majority countries were concerned with Shiism in 2005, the Syrian uprising made anti shiism global, permeating Sunni communities in various parts of the Muslim world. So ISIS exploits this sentiment in its propaganda material. So Shia actors, so you know, exploiting existing um, rhetoric against the Shia. And second, they also, it's, it's easy for them because Shia actors are militarily active which makes defending Sunnis a popular aspiration. So that's another um, way to recruit and mobilize support by talking about Shia actors who are active in the region. So Hezbollah's decision to fight alongside Bashar al-Assad, for example, was seen as the biggest treachery as many Sunnis supported Hezbollah in 2006 when Hezbollah fought against Israel. So Sunnis in the region argue to have been deceived by Hezbollah's demonstration of cross-sectarian agenda in 2006, and now they're supporting the Alawite regime. So Shiite militias, another example, you know, particularly those fighting in Iraq, are perceived as brutal towards Iraqi Sunnis. So you have all these Shia actors, and it's quite easy to mobilize support. And third, the need to contain Shia actors is shared by Sunni actors in the region. So it's not just ISIS, but other Sunni actors are equally concerned about the Shia ascendancy in the region. So this is especially in light of the Saudi-Iranian rivalry in the region as well. And ISIS is doing just that. What it's doing is destabilizing Shia ascendancy. It is now clear that ISIS is fulfilling its obligation as a group committed to defending Sunnis. And that's what it's trying to present, particularly in its propaganda magazines and also in social media outlets. So it is evident that the rhetoric of Sunni polemicists, especially Salafi clerics, is almost identical to ISIS. I've looked at the Salafi clerics in Egypt, um, in Kuwait, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, almost identical to ISIS. And the group builds on existing theological traditions of the radical trend of Salafism. So Sunni polemicists also speak of Shia theological deviance and political treachery. 
During the early stages of the Syrian uprising, images of victims of torture by the Assad regime were widely circulated. And some of the clerics actually um, cried on TV to demonstrate their frustration with what's happening in Assyria. So Salafi and non-Salafi clerics in the region would discuss the predicament of the wretched Sunnis and highlighting the evil nature of Shia believers. So the Syrian uprising witnessed the gradual process of othering in mainstream Muslim societies through traditional and social media outlets. So ISIS media jihad against the Shia utilizes and occupies the space. However, there is a difference between ISIS and other Sunni polemicists, and also the Salafis. For other non-jihadi Sunni actors, the Shia problems requires a different solution. So first, you identify the Shia problem. Second, you establish the position, your position. Therefore, Salafi clerics would argue, it is legitimate for Syrians to defend themselves, and jihad is permissible, however, only for Syrians, but not others. And finally, they support. They support state initiatives to fund Syrians to fight. So it's okay for us to support the state to fight and support Syrians to fight, but we should refrain from traveling to Syria to fight in support of Sunni co-religionists. ISIS militants, ISIS propaganda deals with the subject differently. So similarly, they identify the Shia problem. Um, they establish their positions as well, theologically and politically, in, um, in Dabiq and other social media outlets, that you know, they're theologically deviant, politically treacherous, <coughs> but they urge Sunnis to fight. So that's the difference. ISIS militants provide a different alternative or a different solution. Their propaganda speaks of courage, empowerment, and reclaiming Sunni superiority. In fact, non-jihadi polemicists are often ridiculed for being weak. One prominent Syrian Salafi, which is featured there, Adnan al arau rose to fame after he became the most vocal Salafi against the Assad regime. In one of the television, three more minutes? Oh, one more minute, I'll be very quick. Um, in one of the television lectures, al arau was asked about jihad in Syria by a caller. He reiterated that only Syrians in Syria should fight and others should not travel to Syria to fight. This is the position of non-jihadi Sunni clerics. He was criticized by ISIS sympathizers for being ineffective, hiding in the comfort of his home in Riyadh. In one TV program after the fall of Mosul to ISIS, al arur like other non-jihadi clerics, condemned ISIS. And one woman called into the television program and told the sheikh to stop spreading lies about ISIS. It's part of the, the media jihad. She argued that ISIS militants were the only people who were committed to protecting Sunnis from the corrupt and repressive Shia-led government in Mosul. So the sentiment may have changed today. But it cannot be denied that ISIS propaganda and strategy in 2014 were appealing. So if you look at ISIS sectarian propaganda and its media jihad, it builds on Sunni grievances, whether real or imagined, allowed the group to recruit and launch itself as an effective force to confront Shia political actors in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rayhan. I would like to welcome up our, our next speaker, Farah Ingram, who is a, a research fellow here at the Department of International Relations, and who I've had the great pleasure of working with over the last two years as part of ICCT's Counterterrorism Strategic Communications Project. Um, before his career in academia, Hararo worked in national security, so he also brings very much a practitioner's on-the-ground perspective to his work. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Alastair, and thanks also to um, Matt Davies um, and uh, Michael Wesley for supporting this event and uh, bringing our keynote speaker, uh, Peter Grester, um, here today. When we met a couple of years ago in Brisbane, you know, I, I intended, hopefully, that one day we'd be able to bring Peter here. It took two years in this conference, but we were able to do it, and I'm um, really grateful that you made the time to be here. And also, obviously, uh, thank you to our two international speakers, Dr. Alastair Reid and, and Dr. Craig uh, White, who I've interviewed you. It's always good to speak on a panel with a friend like Rayhan, so 
thank you too. Um, most importantly, however, I need to thank the CAP team up the back there, Kerry and Tabitha, and also Ashley, if she's here today. Thanks very much. This um, obviously would not have happened uh, without, without you. So what I'm going to do today is build on uh, what Ray Hahn has been, um, Rayhan spoke about, and focus my remarks on ISIS and its propaganda strategy, but from a broader strategic logic perspective. And so the picture that I hope to paint for you today is of a strategically minded group that benefits from the misguided response of its adversaries, us. It does not just benefit from our missteps in some abstract, secondary, inadvertent sense. ISIS appears to specifically calibrate its actions and words to leverage our predictable missteps and misinterpretations. Our tendency to be guided by interpretations, as Peter said earlier, that are far more intuitive than empirical. Self-soothing, rather than being grounded in harsh reality. And why a more sophisticated understanding of this group is essential, especially, especially now, as it weakens. But to understand ISIS propaganda, we must step back and understand two central pillars of ISIS's campaign strategy. This is a group that champions a doctrine of perpetual war, on the one hand, and defines survival as the criteria, its definition for avoiding defeat, on the other. As ISIS's late spokesman, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, declared in 2015, and I quote, were you victorious when you cured Abu Musab, Abu Hamza, Abu Umar, or Osama? Would you be victorious if you were to kill Ashashani, Abu Bakr, Abu Zayd, or Abu Amr? No. Indeed, victory is the defeat of one's opponents. Were we defeated when we lost the cities in Iraq and were in the, de in the desert without any city or land? And would we be defeated and you be victorious if you were to take Mosul or Sirt or Raqqa or even take all of the cities and we were to return to our initial condition? Certainly not. True defeat is the loss of willpower and desire to fight. Now think about this for a moment. To, def to avoid defeat is merely to survive. Such a low bar for not failing, for not losing. Yet, on the other hand, a commitment to forever war. Now, the bridge connecting, indeed enabling these two pillars, is ISIS's phased campaign strategy that sees the group transition from terrorism to guerrilla warfare and unconventional political and military activities to more formal, bureaucratized forms of government. And even conventional military activities as it establishes its pseudo state. And of course, reversing down these phases when it's weak. For ISIS to survive, for ISIS to survive is to, defo is to avoid defeat, and to survive it must transition up and down the phases of its campaign strategy. How else could it engage in forever war? How else could it satisfy its own definition of not being defeated? And this is why ISIS insists that its wilayets its provinces not only champion the rhetoric of forever war and its definition of defeat, but operationalize it. How? By applying that phased political and military strategy. ISIS's method, its manhaj, whether in Iraq, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, or the Philippines. This context helps us to understand why ISIS gives propaganda a central role in its campaign strategy. ISIS understand the power of words and images in transforming how human beings understand the world. The raison d'etre of ISIS propaganda is to shape the perceptions and polarize the support of its target audiences, friends, foes, and neutrals. And it does this in two key ways. The first is through what we could call identity choice appeals that are designed to coax audiences into understanding and assessing the world through identity lenses. Narratives that portray a black and white world split between ISIS-aligned Sunnis and literally everyone else. Drawing on pertinent issues and events, ISIS propaganda leverages psychosocial and strategic factors with messaging that both increases perceptions of crisis and offers solutions to those crises. Supporting this effort, ISIS also deploys messages to show how its actions are perceived and how the act how its actions are perceived and how the actions of its enemies are perceived. The purpose behind this type of messaging is to have a force multiplying effect on ISIS's actions. To make itself seem omnipresent, bigger, more dangerous, more influential, while having a force nullifying effect on the actions of its adversaries, that they are weaker and incompetent despite their material advantages. 
A key component of this type of messaging is to highlight that while ISIS does what it says, it has a narrow, narrow say-do gap. It's a say-do gap that is enforced with brutality if necessary. Its enemies, on the other hand, are hypocrites that do not do what they say, whether it's upholding red lines in Syria or the promises of democracy at home. Ultimately, ISIS's propagandists want its supporters to see the world through its lens, through the glasses of its own design, what I have called a competitive system of meaning, a system of meaning because it shapes perceptions, competitive because it must confront the alternative systems of meanings, the messaging of opponents. Drawing on studies from the social and behavioral sciences, particularly of uh, behavioral economists, such as Amos Tversky, Daniel Kahneman, Richard Thaler, we analyzed a whole range of violent extremist propaganda and found that it was strategically designed to cater to its audience's automatic rather than deliberative thinking. It manipulated social context and social cues and sought to trigger and drive cognitive biases in its audiences. But ISIS's messaging strategy is also designed to coax its enemies into seeing the world through ISIS's lens, through the prism of its system of meaning. After all, ISIS's strategy, both its actions and words, is dependent on eliciting responses from its stronger adversaries, which it then uses to launch secondary and tertiary waves of actions and words. Perhaps the best example of an ISIS propaganda trap is around how the group responds to so-called inspired attacks, where the perpetrator has had no support or even direct contact with the group. These types of attackers are an essential component of ISIS strategy, which it encourages in an effort to stretch its enemies' battle, battlefronts from Muslim lands to the streets of the West and create the perception of a global movement. ISIS explicitly states that this is the purpose. And propaganda is vital to achieving this. By calling for attacks in the West, and disseminating instructional material, groups like ISIS are poised to lay claim to attackers who cite their communiques or mimic their prescribed methods. We call it preparatory offensive messaging because it is designed to lay a trap for one's adversaries and facilitate future messaging. In the aftermath of inspired attacks, media reporting and political rhetoric further fuel the jihadist publicity boom by presenting ISIS's skilled propagandists with an opportunity to portray the attack <coughs> as part of not only a larger politico-military struggle, but a global revolution. ISIS and others continue to use this strategy to inspire terrorists because it has, by their calculations, worked to their advantage. All the upside of a terrorist attack being attributed to them and none of the downside of risks involved in planning, directing, resourcing and training. A recent uh, ICCT report found that fewer than one in 10 attacks in the West was carried out under direct orders of ISIS leadership. So there are many examples we could use, but let's take the April 2017 Westminster attack. Here are the raw facts. A man drove into pedestrians, disembarked and stabbed a policeman before being killed. Yet official statements from around the world painted a very different picture. Before ISIS officially acknowledged the attack, after all, they were only just learning about this guy. One Western leader described the events as, quote, an attack on parliaments, freedom and democracy everywhere. Is Prime Minister Turnbull. It did not take long for other politicians and government spokesmen to say the same thing, amplified by wall-to-wall -wall media coverage. So, a coward killing innocents is instantly transformed into an agent of a global movement. The acts of a pathetic loner transformed into attacks on democracies and freedoms everywhere. Indeed, our very way of life. When ISIS parasitically claimed the attack in a manner that suggested it had little prior knowledge of the plot or the plotter, all its propagandists really had to do was reinforce what was now the dominant narrative. During interviews with the Syrian opposition um, a, a couple of years ago, uh, these guys I was speaking to reflected on um, a time very early on in the conflict where they were sharing an office building with the local ISIS media uh, unit. And uh, they described walking past that office when it was open and looking into the office. And they described it as, a, they described it as ISIS madmen. Madmen being the, the, uh, the American uh, dra um, drama series on, adver on an advertising company in the 1950s and 60s. That they were sitting around, sipping tea, and arguing about a word. Not that one, this one. Not that picture, this picture. 
when we kick off the dominant narrative, we do the propaganda work for them. So imagine what the ISIS madmen do. Imagine their logic. Imagine how difficult that discussion has to be for them. What he said. That's what the media release ultimately comes down to. And of course, this is what ISIS requires most for its survival, is well-meaning people who underestimate and misinterpret it. Politicians and journalists, not to mention a few talking head experts in the media, need to be far better educated about the strategic logic of ISIS propaganda. Even a rudimentary understanding, like the one I just laid out today, could help politicians to avoid stumbling into ISIS propaganda traps and enable journalists to keep them and the talking heads accountable. Ultimately, a more sophisticated, nuanced, <coughs> empirically based understanding of our adversaries is in fact the only way that we can generate more sophisticated, nuanced and empirically based counterterrorism and counterviolent extremism strategic communications. Now, all I have done today is highlight the most basic mechanics of ISIS propaganda. There are a litany of other strategies and levers ISIS uses in its propaganda efforts. From hedging, which is the tendency for ISIS to emphasize certain themes during boom periods and certain themes during bust periods, to imbue its propaganda strategy with elasticity over time in, and enabling it to pivot, to pivot in the information theater as those strategic conditions change, to its use of responsibility to protect, R2P messaging. Indeed, my current research is examining jihadist R2P doctrine, which actually beat Gareth Evans and the United Nations by a couple of decades, and is a crucial way in which groups like ISIS appeal to its audiences. Now, many of you may be thinking, but ISIS are in big trouble. And you're right, ISIS are in big trouble. But think back to the strategic logic I just described. Think back to the strategic logic of ISIS propaganda I just laid out for you. Propaganda is important for ISIS when it's strong during those boom periods like 2014-15. But it is even more important during its bust periods. It increases in strategic importance as ISIS weakens politically militarily And this, of course, makes perfect strategic sense. ISIS's propaganda machine will be essential for amplifying the effects of whatever actions it can manage in the field or claim as their actions. They will be even more reliant upon setting propaganda traps for its adversaries so that we reinforce how ISIS want to be perceived by friends and enemies. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Harare. I'd like to welcome up our last speaker, Dr. Craig Whiteside from the Naval War College in Monterey. Um, Dr. Whiteside um, teaches um, national security affairs to military officers and prior to his academic career, served for a number of years in the US military, including a tour of duty in Iraq in 2006 and 2007. So he speaks from a lot of personal experience. I'd like to thank the uh, Department of International Relations for bringing me here. Uh, this is my third visit to Australia, and each one's gotten better uh, each time. Um, of course, my uh, first visit was training with the 3rd uh, Royal Australian Regiment which is uh, known as a parachute, well, they're, they're the equivalent of the British Paras and uh, American paratroopers. And uh, compared, to, uh, compared to that visit, uh, I've only been called Bloody Yank once this visit, so it's a, it's a success, right? Um, I'd like to talk about the virtual caliphate uh, and the idea of media jihad uh, as, as one of the topics of this, uh, of this conference. And the, the concept of the virtual caliphate it's an idea that, as, uh, as Ferrara mentioned, as, as ISIS is defeated and loses its physical territory, particularly in Mosul and Raqqa, and in other places, of course, uh, that they're going to retreat into this virtual caliphate and, and demonstrate the capabilities that, that uh, our speakers have talked about, the power of the, the persuasive word, uh, their media apparatus, et cetera. And um, you could even find a hashtag on Twitter uh, the virtual caliphate, if you're interested, if you're a Twitter person and, and you're interested in looking at it. Uh, and, and this idea has been accepted by no less uh, the important actor, the CENTCOM, US Central Command, who is kind of uh, shepherding or assisting the coalition that's defeating the Islamic State, at least in Syria and Iraq, and certainly assisting in other places. Uh, and the, their understanding is that as, as the, the caliphate is lost, uh, 
that, that ISIS will transition into this virtual caliphate and that is gonna be the power, of course, the power of ideas. And that ties in well with this conference. Um, my, my colleague Haror and I have written about this and we feel that this is, this is wrong for, for two reasons, uh, for many reasons, but two that I'll talk about. One, the idea of the virtual caliphate is almost an oxymoron in the sense that the caliphate itself is a physical governing system. It allows the people who belong to the calif caliphate to worship in the way that they want to worship. And that is enforced and ensured by a governing system, which happens in the physical world, in the physical reality. So the idea of a virtual caliphate itself is a bit off. As, as my friend Will McCann says, they already, there's already a concept of that in Islam itself, and that's the Ummah, this idea that, that, that identity is important in, in who you are, not necessarily nationalities, and then they can be all over the world. And certainly, as Rehan talked about, the Salafis have their own identity and, and their own networked identity that's global to be sure. So the, that's the idea that I think is behind the virtual caliphate, but it, it's got some problems. And the second one is what Herrero talked about so well, so I don't have to, and that's the, the differences and definitions of defeat. The, the Islamic State's definition as, as uh, articulated by Muhammad al-Adnani is a very, very high bar, all right, to strip his religion away from him. Of course, he's dead. Um, that is the idea, that it's very hard. CENTCOM's idea is that victory happens once the, the caliphate physically does not exist. And that is problematic, especially in the understanding, as Herrera pointed out, the different levels that they will operate in the future. Once their caliphate is physically reduced, they will operate at a purely and, and uniformly irregular warfare, guerrilla warfare across the spectrum. In many different places, Iraq and Syria to be sure, but continuing in, in Libya, and the Philippines more prominently. Um, so those are the two reasons that we push back on this. We think a better understanding comes from the idea that the political project, politics, and the information aspect of ISIS, their media jihad, if you will, or their cyber jihad, as Nico Pruka calls it, is that they're symbiotically related, is that they have to, they feed each other in a, in a particular way in that, in that political project. Um, this is not to say that people who use the term virtual caliphate, if they're referring specifically uh, as, a, as a cute term for media jihad, that's understandable. Um, and even possibly that the virtual caliphate might be an extension of ge geographic regions that aren't contiguous to Iraq and Syria as we understand the so-called caliphate today, right? So the, the, we can understand that, but we'd really like to focus on that symbiotic relationship between the political project or reality, as you, as you would understand it, and operations that are happening in the information domain, whether they be cyber, whether they be real, on the ground um, information or propaganda. <clears throat> so to some, the way to kill this virtual shadow of the real caliphate uh, is, of course, is to starve out the real one. It's to reduce not just the physical governance of territory by an armed group like the Islamic State, specifically the Islamic State, but to prevent its return, to do the, the appropriate actions in order to prevent its return. Um, that is what's gonna affect this media jihad that is so fearful and so powerful, according uh, to our previous speakers. How long is this gonna take? Again, my friend Will McCann says, it could take as long as 10 years to, to, to physically, to, to reduce the attraction of the dream of, a, of this uh, political project, which is specifically the creation of a modern caliphate that's run according to the Salafi method, as Rehan um, alluded to. Um, let's look at this. So this is a very theoretical discussion to this point. I'd like to look at empirically what has happened in the past that would lead uh, Herrera and myself to this conclusion. If you look back at this earlier stages of this group in 2007, when they're known as the Islamic State of Iraq, um, they, were, they were named that in 2006 by their, uh, the successors to Zarqawi. And during that year, in 2007, if you look at their media department, which is prolific at the time, they're producing a th over a thousand unique propaganda um, whether it's media releases, press releases, notices, claims, videos, um, certainly they're not the, the standard <clears throat> that they are today, but they're very prolific in 2007. 
By 2010, that amount has reduced to about 10 to 15 percent of the output. Um, again, not looking at quality. So what, what happened there? What causes the reduction in the IS movement's propaganda during that time period? And simply their lack of success uh, due to various political and the strategic environment that, that occurred in Iraq from 2006 to 2009. Tribal uprisings, a removal of support from the Sunni community. As Rehan mentioned, the support for I, the IS movement in its early days was, was growing and became robust, and then it eventually collapsed <coughs> on them. <clears throat> so you see, that is the way that we understand the virtual <coughs> caliphate as reducing in, in potency in the future. If you look at 2010, <clears throat> Zarqawi's successors, uh, Abu Omar and Abu Hamza, are killed by the Iraqi soft and coalition with coalition support. It takes until mid to late 2011 before Abu Bakr, their, their successor, makes his first statement. So, and this is, this is instrumental or important because uh, there was a lot of pressure within the community to say something. What is, this, what is the state of this political project? What is the future of this insurgency uh, for the future? And, and the answer that was given by people like Muhammad al-Adnani, who was the spokesman at the time, was we need patience, we need time. We are not successful right now, and there's no, there's no point in coming out and, and establishing a very powerful media campaign until we're ready. Um, and the problem, and so that was, that was what we saw, and what we understood was that the group was defeated at this time, and there's, there's large reasons to think that it's true. But it also created an illusion for us that behind the scenes this group is reorganizing, recruiting, rebuilding, creating new political conditions, and taking advantage of what is happening near, next door in Syria, but also in what is happening in Iraq with some of the sectarian tensions that Rehan mentioned uh, of this Shia government that is not seemingly uh, perceptually giving the Sunnis of Iraq a fair shake. And that's, that is the, the type of uh, environment. But certainly, it is the military activities that drive the majority of the propaganda and the media jihad that's going on at this time. And you see it as an upswing in reports in 2011, 12, and 13 until they've reached uh, the culmination. Uh, and of note, they're already controlling territory long before they're able to, to seize Mosul in 2014. Um, and again, this is reflected all in their uh, propaganda. So to conclude, I'd like to tie it into this idea of info wars and this fear of media and an actor that's out there manipulating the media and tie it in with some of Peter's ideas and concepts. Um, <clears throat> there's a parallel, and that's the Russian influence in, in dem democratic campaigns as well. This fear that they are able to manipulate us and that something must be done in order to, uh, to stop this, this type of nefarious influence. Um, and certainly that happens on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter to the point where we're demanding that those platforms do something to reduce this influence. In the case of IS, you've seen an, a very active campaign that's been relatively successful in denying them these platforms to, to communicate to their followers. As compared to 2013 and 2014, when I could follow people like Shami Witness and, and get um, a prime supporter of the group who is pushing their propaganda nonstop on very mainstream platforms. So it's quite a difference. And it's somewhat of a success story, as, as some research has shown, in pushing them almost entirely off of Twitter, but, but certainly um, impacting them in other areas of it. Now, this is necessary but not sufficient, and it can't be looked at as a silver bullet, because again, it's the political project, that symbiotic relationship, the, the defeat of the political project is what will be the lasting, uh, lead to the lasting defeat of this particular group. All right. Um, the media is only a facilitator to their propaganda. This is what ISIS says themselves. Uh, in in our, my ICCT media history, it's, I titled the, the paper, Lighting the Path. They understand that the media is just illuminating a path for the political project to be successful. They have no illusions themselves that the media is the power behind their success. It is an enabler, 
and that is what it's always been. So, so focusing on shutting that down is interesting, but it leads to a, a serious policy question, right? And the policy perspective. And should the anti-media campaign or the media suppression campaign that's been used against IS be used against other actors that are manipulating public opinion um, in different areas? Um, and I would, I would warn strongly against that. This is a strategy that's being used against what we can consider to be the exception to the rule. Um, this is a this is an organization that, as we can see from their own writings, their own propaganda, is dedicated to and celebrates violence in the achievement of their political goal. And because of that, they ha are treated differently than other actors, maybe even like the Muslim Brotherhood or, or, or any political actors that are operating in our spheres of communication. And I think that's an important, an important thing to think about uh, for the future, and that's to treat them as the exception as we deal with the other aspects of the information wars that we're gonna talk about today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Whiteside. We have got just a few minutes or a few questions. Is there any questions from the audience? Question there, Lee. Oh, yourself. Stand up, the microphones are just coming. I'm addressing the questions to uh, Dr. Harara Ingram. Yeah, the question says, to what extent um, ISIS can be described as a terrorist organizations? Is it more because of uh, its violent approach or is it because uh, it's anti-status quo behavior? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. That's an excellent question. I might get um, Rayhan and Craig to uh, help out with answering this as well. Um, I think what's important for us to think about, and I'm someone who approaches this as a generalist, you know, I mean, I, I, I adopt a strategic perspective on, on, on analysing these groups, and I think what's, what's important for us as both uh, researchers, as analysts, but also potentially for the strategic policy makers sitting in the room here today and listening in, is that we need to understand that ISIS, that the, the ISIS spectrum, that on one end of that spectrum is ISIS, the terrorist organisation, the terrorist network, and then... Um, on the other end of that spectrum is uh, ISIS, the pseudo state, you know, the so called caliphate, you know, and so, and then there's this transition point in the middle there, um, as I kind of described in the presentation, um, where it needs to use essentially guerrilla warfare to transition from um, that terrorist state, that terrorist network state, um, through to establishing a state. So, so that they transition through un unconventional politico military activities. And then as they, they start to reach symmetry with their adversaries, with their enemies in that location, they then attempt to, to um, um, establish a state. Um, and so they conventionalize those political military activities. Now this is very, very important for understanding. This is very important when we look at trying to understand what's going on in Southeast Asia, you know, um, uh, in South Asia, in Africa, in other parts of the Middle East. And so, um, uh, it, and there is a predictive uh, kind of quality that comes with understanding that. It's essential, I mean, I spend most of my time talking to, to, to specialists, to country specialists here, to, to understand the, try to understand those local nuances. And I hope that perhaps the value that I might bring to those discussions is being able to say, well, hey, there, there are really important strategic principles that this group takes from its central location and it demands of its provinces. It demands of its wilayets. So when we look at, for example, what happens in, for example, Malawi, what happened in the Philippines there, there are a lot of very important local reasons for that. But a big part of what, what ISIS was implementing in the field there were the strategic principles, that manhaj, that methodology. Now, when we look at it on, on the furthest fringes of its reach in the West, for example, then, yeah, you know, that, that, that's very much a terrorist organisation, that terrorist network. But we have to understand it from that spectrum. I would just add... Uh, the, the illegal aspect of the violence, of course, that's a very subjective idea, is that 
something is illegal, but certainly from an international law perspective, from the law of war, the, the, the law of war, um, as well as national laws, that, that most of, if not the predominance of their violence is not being done on conventional battlefields per se, or even conventional battlefields against the Assad regime or even the Iraqi government, but that is happening um, also just outside of the conventional activities, both in Iraq and Syria, in the Philippines, in Libya, across the world, and then as well in Western countries as in the more um, understandable version that we use terrorism. But all of it can, I think, normatively be described as, as terror. Um, I don't like to use the, the use of the word terror group because they they're really have a political project and, and that's problematic to just call them a terror group. They're a group or insurgency that uses terror as a tactic. And that, I think that helps me a lot of times understand the difference. We have time for just a couple more questions. Take one over there. The microphones are just coming down. Thank you very much for the presentation. The, this uh, question uh, addressed to all speakers, but especially to Dr. Raihan. So uh, do you think ISIS is successful in spreading their uh, propaganda using the rhetoric uh, the sectarian rhetoric since I its establishment in 1999 as we know that the way they spread the way they they use this propaganda is basically against their uh, theological belief thank you we take the second question at the same time differences in the English language publication as opposed to the Arabic language publication, do they, how do they translate different words or concepts in the different languages and does that at all um, impact the way that propaganda is spread or is there any sort of cultural diversity among even Middle Eastern states about the languages that they use um, and, and does that have any implications do you think? Thank you. Yeah, very good questions, thank you. Um, when it comes to, I'll answer your question first, um, whether or not it's successful, I think ISIS played an important role in really um, propagating that Shia um, believers are removed from Islam. However, we have to think about existing rhetoric um, and they're only building from existing rhetoric. I think the Saudis in particular um, the Saudi Salafis in particular have been quite active in propagating that Shiism is removed from Islam. Um, of course, there are various trends within the Salafi trend itself. So you have the moderate Salafis, you have the more radical Salafis, but mainly um, it is seen as, in, uh, is seen as um, they, they agree that Shiism is, is removed from Islam. Um, with ISIS, I think what they've done, which is quite successful, is that legitimize the killings of Shia. Um, in many ways, that's the difference between ISIS rhetoric and Salafi rhetoric. The Salafis would not legitimize the killings of Shia, um, regardless of their political treachery or theological deviance. They're quite careful, and that's part of the Salafi propaganda. But with ISIS, it's quite different. So if you look at jihadi Salafis, they're more vocal um, in legitimizing um, the killings of Shia. So I think in that way, jihadi theoreticians and ISIS theoreticians have been quite successful in demonstrating that the Shia, they're deviant, they're treacherous, it is permissible to kill them. So that's the difference, I think, between the Salafis, um, you know, non-jihadi Salafis and jihadi <coughs> Salafis, particularly with ISIS as well. Um, so going to your question, I think whether or not there's a difference between um, English propaganda um, magazines, uh, ISIS magazines in English or in Arabic and other languages. I can only speak for Arabic and a little bit of Bahasa. Um, I don't look at Bahasa so much, um, but in Arabic, obviously, they refer to local clerics a lot more. Um, so that's part of their propaganda as well, to look at local circumstances. The English um, publication would look at um, other 
um, you know, more, more global. I think they wanted to reach out to the global audience, but the Arabic is, is especially looks at local um, clerics and local circumstances. They deal with that a lot more. For example, the ISIS manifesto on women. Um, so it was translated into English, but the Arabic version deals with local Saudi clerics, and you can tell that there's a lot of appeal to Saudi women in particular. So I think that's the difference when you look at you know, the English version and also um, the um, Arabic version. But I do think that that's what they do as well to appeal to those who they think that they're speaking to. We have far too many out of time, so just a quick comment from our last piece. Well, I'd, all I'd add is just, yeah, when it comes to the English language, um, uh, kind of uh, propaganda, um, from ISIS, what's been remarkable um, for me is the way that they are able to uh, leverage local, and I mean very <coughs> local, I'm talking like at a suburb level um, kind of issues um, with their propaganda, but still maintain its relevance for a broader audience. And it's one of these things, it's kind of like why we go into the field to do this research, is because you can intellectually understand something, but it's kind of when you feel it that you really realise. And it was with um, issue one of Ramia magazine, um, and the eulogy in there, which kind of involved, a, it, it featured a, a, a guy from Melbourne. And that article could be read, and a kid in London would understand it, you know, it would it, resonate with them, it would broadly resonate with them. But as a, someone who lived in Victoria for several years, uh, there were details in that, that that a Victorian kid, not just a Victorian kid, a kid living in, say, Preston and Brunswick, would go, wow, they understand what I'm talking about. And to, to me, that's, that's when the absurdity of slick production, social media and gory violence, as, as an explain for this stuff, it just, it's laughable. The sophistication of the group really, this is just one way, I think, that it's really highlighted, just that, that nuance, you know? So as I'm prone to do, I'll go back into history of the of the movement and say their very one of their very first attacks in 2003 was against the Imam Ali Mosque, and it was obvious it signaled their their agenda. And they were criticized by that, as Rayhan pointed out in, the, in, in a famous letter. Al, Al Qaeda, who was their uh, their their figurehead or their 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 parent organization at the time affiliate, although it was very loose, told them to please stop doing that because it would it would it would disrupt their reputation within the Ummah at large. Uh, and that was never adhered to. But what, what I noticed in my research was that IS just stopped claiming these attacks. So, th so they manipulated that. They just stopped claiming them until about 2007. During their losing period, they actually start claiming these attacks, maybe because they feel they have to. But they've, I think they've also normalized this sectarian attack and that, the, that, that certain elements, both globally and locally, were supportive of this due to the effects of the civil war. So post-2006 Samara bombing, which they did not claim as well, they, they, re, they denied it three times, they, they begin claiming it and, and since then have obviously um, specialized in that kind of propaganda. Absolutely, thank you to our three panelists for three excellent presentations.